For generations, the tobacco industry has tried to convince millions of people that smoking is cool, sexy and completely harmless. And they've done a good job. For every day, we smoke billions of cigarettes, year in and year out. In fact, it's one of the most successful advertising campaigns in history, and one in which seduction, suppression and the distortion of facts have been a crucial element. Because for more than 50 years, it's been a well-known fact that smoking causes cancer, and despite the fall in tobacco consumption in developed countries, the global consumption of tobacco continues to rise. Smoking is still one of the most frequent causes of death in the world, and the number of people who die due to smoking is now over 4 million a year. The epidemic, as the World Health Organization calls it, will apparently never end. What a comfort a smoke can be. Some artists find they can't paint without a puff. The film star would be lost without the added glamour of a cigarette. Today we're only too pleased to be able to do this. We present the family model. When father says puff, we all puff. Cigarettes have always been linked with relaxation and enjoyment. In the beginning, only for a few exclusive groups. But in the 20th century, mass production and modern marketing made cigarettes available to the masses. Before the development of the cigarette manufacturing machine, it was very expensive to make cigarettes, so very few people could afford them. And with the development of a machine that would make cigarettes, it brought the cost way down. The second important development was the development of safety matches, so people could light the cigarettes. And the third and probably the most important one was the development of modern advertising and public relations, which occurred in the 1910s. And the first really big push for cigarettes came in World War I, where the tobacco companies arranged for the troops to get free cigarettes. <laughs> During World War I, cigarettes were included in soldiers' rations, and one European and American military company after another smoked their first cigarettes in the dismal trenches. Lucky strike means fine tobacco. When the war ended, millions of young men were regular consumers of tobacco, and with the persuasive help of massive marketing, the decade between 1910 and 1920 saw the consumption of cigarettes in the U.S. alone rise sixfold. The tobacco industry pioneered many of the techniques that we now celebrate in, in mass marketing. 1923, uh, Lucky Strike Means Fine Tobacco was spelled out in enormous letters over Times Square. That's the first time uh, that was ever used. Tobacco was then later pioneered in, in radio, in mass uh, distribution magazines, women's magazines, sports magazines. The tobacco industry was soon to realize that women too were a huge potential market, even though only a small number of women smoked in the 1920s, for the moral of the times dictated that women should not indulge. But with a sure sense of the times, the tobacco industry launched a creative marketing campaign. One day, Mr. George Hill, president of the American Tobacco Company, called me in and said, we're losing half of our market. And I said, why, Mr. Hill? He said, there's a taboo by men that does not permit women to smoke. What can we do about breaking down that taboo? Advertising agent Edward Bernays contacted some female acquaintances and convinced them to march in the Easter parade, smoking what he launched as Torches of Freedom. Next morning, there wasn't a newspaper in the United States. Even the New York Times had a front page story, Debutantes Light Torches of Freedom to Protest Man's Inhumanity to Women by a taboo against smoking. The tobacco industry's advertisements appealed to many types of women. The sporty type, the racy type, and the woman with weight problems. Reach for a Lucky instead of a Sweet, urged the manufacturer of Lucky Strike. In the 20s, the number of women smokers trebled, as did the production of cigarettes. 
The biggest breakthrough of the century for the cigarette industry, however, came during World War II. The Overseas League organized a tobacco fund quite early in the war to provide smokes for the services. And the first donor was His Majesty the King. Immediate help came from all over the world, particularly from the United States. In the first year, over 70 million cigarettes were thus sent out. Smokes are in camp and the boys feel as delighted as you do. By the end of the war, four out of five British men smoked. In the post-war era, the need for cigarettes created long queues outside tobacconists. Once again, the American tobacco industry came to the aid of cigarette-hungry Europeans. A major part of the Marshall Plan to uh, rebuild Europe was uh, free tobacco. So uh, between 1945 and 19, early 1950s, 90,000 tons of tobacco were sent free of charge to Germany. And a billion dollars was spent on uh, tobacco to be distributed free to the Europeans. Whilst cigarettes were being smoked as never before, critics began to warn against them, for it was common knowledge that cigarettes caused throat irritation and coughing. <laughs> But then, an increasing number of scientific studies indicated a far more serious effect of smoking. Coffin nails. Yes, that's what cigarettes are, according to the Medical Research Council. We've all heard something of the kind before, yet almost everybody smokes, including thousands young enough to know better. And as smoking is nowadays allowed nearly everywhere, it's on the increase year after year. So is lung cancer. In the early 1950s, there were several very important complementary studies that were done. Sir Richard Dahl did his very large epidemiological study showing that British doctors who smoked got lung cancer a lot more than British doctors who didn't smoke. At the same time, Ernst Winder here in the United States did experiments where they painted mice with tobacco tar and got cancer. And those two facts coming together attracted a huge amount of public interest. The Reader's Digest, which is published in many different languages and is one of the most widely read magazines, wrote about the convincing studies, and the rest of the press followed suit in what was to be the worst crisis yet for the tobacco industry, as tobacco sales fell for the first time, as did stock by 10%. With most products, if you find a tainted product, you know, people bottled water or aspirin or something, that whether it's tainted, the manufacturer just pulls it off the market and fixes the problem. Well, that wasn't how the tobacco companies responded. There was a very famous secret meeting in, in late 1953 at the Plaza Hotel in New York City where the, the leaders of all the big tobacco companies got together with their lawyers and of the public relations firm of Hill and Knowlton and came up with a, a brilliant strategy of, of, quote, creating controversy. Said the boss to his senior VP, I want you to listen to me. I mean it, no joke, this new port's a smoke with a smooth taste, I know you'll agree. Oh, smoother new port. According to this nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. The tobacco companies had understood at that point that they didn't really have to convince people smoking was safe, which was impossible. They just had to convince them that the case was still open. On January the 4th, 1954, the tobacco industry launched a full-page advertisement in 448 American newspapers under the headline, A Frank Statement to Cigarette Smokers. The industry wrote, we accept an interest in people's health, but we believe the products we make are not injurious to health. And in the same ad, the industry said it would establish a tobacco industry research committee to investigate the connection between tobacco and health. The purpose of the organization that they set up, the Council for Tobacco Research, was simply to distract people uh, from the real issue, to enable the industry to say, we're studying the problem, uh, look at all the money we're giving uh, for tobacco health research, and when we finally come up with an answer, we'll let you know. Well, and for the next 40 years, 
They said, uh, we have no evidence that there's any tobacco hazards. We're studying this problem. It needs more research. We need to make sure it's based on sound science. Our reporter interviewed Sir Alexander Maxwell, chairman of the Tobacco Manufacturers Standing Committee. So far, what are the conclusions reached by your organization? They are given very clearly in the annual report which we've just issued, and uh, which shows, I think, that there is need for much more research over a wide area. And in my opinion, to single out smoking as a causal agent is on the evidence to date completely unjustified. Well, thank you very much, sir, for your help. Well, thank you very much for letting me put our views forward. You better have a cigarette before you go. Thank you. Goodbye. Doubt became a permanent ally of the tobacco industry, and after a short decline in cigarette sales, most people continued smoking as if nothing had happened. Almost 10 years passed before the US Surgeon General unequivocally stated the dangers of smoking in an extensive report published in 1964 on smoking and its consequences. In view of the continuing and mounting evidence from many sources, it is the judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. Due to the report, the tobacco industry was now required to warn consumers of the dangers of tobacco. Since 1965, every packet of cigarettes in the U.S. must state, smoking can be hazardous to your health. However, one question which becomes very significant later was answered by the Surgeon General in carefully chosen phrases. One of the conclusions was that nicotine and smoking weren't addictive, they were just habits. Well, it turns out that the tobacco companies had already well established a couple of years earlier that nicotine was an addictive drug. There's a very famous memorandum from Addison Yeaman, who was the head lawyer, at Brown and Williamson Tobacco saying we're in the business of selling nicotine, an addictive drug. And all of this research on nicotine addiction, which the tobacco companies had secretly done, was all withheld from the Surgeon General's committee. Why would you want to pay as much as $1,000 for a single bed mattress when you can buy a high quality locally made mattress like this for as little as $220? And a queen size mattress could cost you in excess of $3,000, but at Nelson Beds you could have a mattress like this as low as $425. So why would you go out and spend a fortune on your child's bedroom when you can come to Nelson Beds and buy a complete single mattress and base set, a 7 drawer scotch chest, a headboard and a 3 drawer bedside cabinet for as little as $979? So call and discuss our custom manufacturing options and local after sales service at Nelson Beds, Nelson's only bedding manufacturer. We're the team at JCAR, right here in Nelson, 120 Hardy Street. Our shop is full of electronic items, including security alarm systems, electronic components, solar and power, electronics toys, sound systems, cables, and much, much more. Jacob, 120 Hardy Street, Nelson. Edward Gibbon, the bathroom specialist, have a great range of bathroom ideas at their showroom at 23 McGlashan Ave in Richmond. Call in and check out some of the latest bathroom designs and fittings. Edward Gibbon, the bathroom plumbing and drainage supply specialist, 23 McGlashan Ave, Richmond. For the tobacco industry, the amount of nicotine in cigarettes was the key to continuing sales. They realized that if its content was diminished, people would be less addicted and eventually quit. So in all secrecy, the American firm Philip Morris developed a technique which intensified the effect of nicotine. The tobacco industry in the mid-1960s starts adding ammonia to tobacco leaves during the processing so that you get this very hard, free-based uh, impact. And what it does is it delivers the nicotine to the bloodstream very, very rapidly, and so you get a big kick. It's called free-basing, and this same process was later imitated uh, in the manufacture of cocaine in order to make crack cocaine in the 1970s. 
And the cigarette that this was done with was Marlboro. Come to where the flavor is. Come to Marlboro country. If you look at the internal industry documents, all the other companies, Reynolds, Lorillard, and so forth, they're all saying, why is Marlboro doing so well? And they start uh, reverse engineering the process and looking at the chemistry, and they find out that Philip Morris has been adding ammonia, and so most of the major tobacco manufacturers, they start freebasing their tobacco, producing this much more addictive, much more powerful cigarette. The consumption of tobacco continued to rise rapidly. In 1960, the world's population smoked 2,000 billion cigarettes, but by 1970, it had reached 3,000 billion. In the US, cigarettes were the most advertised product on radio and television, but in the late 60s, the industry began meeting opposition, and a so-called fairness doctrine in American law forced TV stations to provide free advertising time for anti-smoking campaigns. This young man has just quit smoking for a variety of intelligent reasons. Now he faces the biggest test of all. For a few years, there was a tremendous amount of anti-smoking advertising run nationally. And even though the tobacco companies were running three times as much advertising as the health message was, that's when we saw the first long, continued drop in cigarette consumption. Everybody's beginning to get the message. Cigarette smoking is nowhere. Now, the tobacco companies realized these ads were killing them. And so the tobacco companies went to Congress and said, OK, we want you to ban cigarette advertising on radio and television. Now, most people think that was a victory for the health groups, but it was actually a defeat because it knocked all of the anti-smoking ads off the air for decades. Even though tobacco ads are prohibited on TV, cigarettes are still shown on the screen as an insistent industry finds new ways of promoting their products. It was really the tobacco companies who pioneered the idea of product placement. And they paid, for example, Sylvester Stallone to smoke in several of his movies. They paid to get Lark cigarettes into License to Kill, a James Bond movie because they recognized the tremendous emotional power, protect, particularly with kids, of seeing smoking in the movies. They paid for Superman too, uh, a, obviously a kid-oriented movie, in which Lois Lane chain-smoked Marlboro. And Lois Lane had never smoked in comic books, had never smoked in the Superman TV series, in any other representation of Lois Lane, she simply had never smoked. And in the climactic event of the movie, Superman is thrown into the side of a giant Marlboro truck. A truck never before in existence and only created for this movie. And that movie is still today shown on primetime TV. And it's basically a Marlboro ad. Perhaps the most egregious example of targeting to children um, was when R.J. Reynolds introduced a cartoon character named Joe Camel with highly visual ads that appealed to young people. It's not surprising that almost immediately after the introduction of the Joe Camel cartoon character, smoking of Camel cigarettes among young people increased. The cartoon character Joe Camel became better known among American children than Mickey Mouse. And in just four short years, Camel's market share amongst young people rose from one half of a percent to 32 percent. The sad story is the fact that the tobacco industry knows that at least in the United States, 90 percent of all new long-term smokers start as children. And the tobacco industry knows that if they don't hook them as kids, they won't hook them as adults. Their marketing reflects that. The 
global consumption of tobacco continued to rise. But a groundbreaking study in Japan on the correlation between secondhand smoke and lung cancer was soon to set a whole new agenda. A major turning point took place in 1981 when Takeshi Hariyama in Japan published a study in the British Medical Journal saying non-smoking women married to men who smoke had a higher risk of lung cancer than non-smoking women married to non-smoking men. Over a period of 14 years, Professor Hiriyama from the Japanese Cancer Institute studied the frequency of lung cancer among 91,540 non-smoking women whose husbands were smokers. This extensive study showed that these women had more than twice the risk of contracting lung cancer than women who lived with non-smokers. The tobacco industry responds to this with a massive campaign saying the science is no good. They set up the uh, Center for Indoor Air Research uh, to thwart these claims. They basically try to redistribute the blame and say the problem is not with other people's smoke, it's with bad ventilation. So that the buildings are sick and they invent this concept of sick building syndrome. Because this was a, a really crucial political issue for them. If It was one thing if smokers were killing themselves. It's something else if smokers are killing other people. The proof that secondhand smoke can cause lung cancer gave rise to a strong anti-smoking movement in California. And as one of the first states to do so, California introduced strict rules concerning smoking in workplaces, and the Department of Health launched a massive campaign. We had people in the health department, a fellow in particular named Dalip Ball, who was a visionary and who said, you know, I'm not just going to tell people, this is in 1988, 89, I'm not just going to tell people that smoking is bad, I want to tell them that it's the cigarette companies that are bad. Gentlemen, the tobacco industry has a very serious multi-billion dollar problem. We need more cigarette smokers, pure and simple. Every and so the original ad run in the California anti-smoking campaign in 1990, it showed a group of people sitting around a table in a boardroom laughing about addicting people. So forget about all that heart disease, cancer, emphysema, stroke stuff. <laughs> We're not in this business for our health. <laughs> <laughs> it was an absolutely radical departure from anything that had ever been done before. And the, the whole idea of the California campaign was three messages. The tobacco companies lie, nicotine is addictive, and secondhand smoke kills. The campaign in California had an enormous effect. In its 14-month duration, the percentage of smokers fell from 26% to 16%. The pressure on the industry increased, and several American states prohibited smoking in public buildings and restaurants. Then, in 1994, during a congressional hearing held to clarify legislation on tobacco, the industry suffered its most serious defeat. Please consider yourself to be under oath. During the hearing, seven executives from the industry were asked whether they would acknowledge that nicotine was addictive, as indeed they had done secretly 25 years earlier. Just yes or no, do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. That day that, that, that the New York Times came out with that story, April 15th, 1994, I was in the elevator, the, a woman was standing next to me and I was reading the story. And she suddenly burst out and said, that is such a lie, it is, I'm a smoker, she said, and I know it is so addicting. We call them the seven dwarfs, the seven tobacco executives all got up there and said nicotine is not addictive. Please consider yourself to be under oath. You know, undermining the legitimacy of the tobacco industry is a tremendously important part of a tobacco control program. If you're that ad, that hearing, was converted into a 30-second spot here in California that was used in their anti-smoking education program. Not addictive, not addictive, not addictive. 
Shortly after the congressional hearing, another case which questioned the tobacco industry's credibility was brought forward. For several years, an employee of the American tobacco manufacturer Brown & Williamson had photocopied thousands of secret documents. These were documents between their highest level executives, their highest level scientists, their highest level lawyers and public relations people, and they were very, very frank. And in there we found the memo from Addison Yeaman at Brown and Williamson saying we're in the business of selling nicotine, an addictive drug, in 1963. We found the agreement with Sylvester Stallone to smoke Brown and Williamson products in, in, in several of his movies for $500,000. We found the, the evidence that they clearly understood that smoking caused cancer in the early 50s. There were the papers about smoker compensation in engineering cigarettes. And, and it was just amazing. I mean, looking inside, it was like being led into Hitler's bunker in World War II. anything, the exposure of the tobacco industry's secret knowledge contributed to making restrictions more stringent. With a ban on advertising, the introduction of smoke-free workplaces, anti-smoking campaigns and higher taxation, all effectively implemented by health authorities. In the US, the consumption of tobacco peaked in the early 80s and over the next 10 years also fell in most European countries. The global consumption of tobacco, however, is still rising, especially in third world countries. China is being described as a gigantic market. China uh, smokes a third of the world's cigarettes. Japan smokes. Asia is growing very, very rapidly. By World War II, there were very few cigarettes still smoked in uh, uh, India. Now they smoke many, many hundreds of billions. So the recognition is that there are going to be markets outside the developed world and Africa, Eastern Europe, Asia, these are all markets the industry is heading for very, very hard. After the demise of the Iron Curtain, Eastern Europe offered an attractive market for the tobacco industry where aggressive marketing especially appeals to young Eastern Europeans. After Marlboros were launched in the Czech Republic, the number of 15 to 16 year old smokers increased by 40 percent. The global consumption of tobacco is still on the increase, just as is the number of those contracting the tobacco related diseases which kill more than 4 million people every year. It is an epidemic because there is no doubt nowadays that uh, tobacco consumption is the leading cause of uh, preventable death and is the second uh, cause of death worldwide. And as long as it is still expanding, this is, uh, this is an epidemic. The tobacco industry is producing not just cigarettes, but an image of smoking. They're producing an image of smoking which is safe, sexy, even risky, risky in a good way like bungee jumping or skydiving. This, you have to realize, is the most successful propaganda campaign in modern history. Uh, it's managed to convince hundreds of millions of people that smoking is acceptable, that it's safe, uh, that it's desirable, that it's attractive and it's going to be successful for a long, long time. You know, if someone came down from Mars today and said, I have a new product that will kill five million people in the world, it's addictive, we'll get mo most people will start using it when they're kids before they really understand what's going on, and we can make a lot of money. No government in the world would allow them to do that. No government in the world would allow them to market it.